Good morning, my name is Holly Fry. I'm a high school biology teacher in Roanoke, Virginia. I hold a master's degree in molecular biology, microbiology, and biochemistry. We are on day three of distance learning and my lecture today is an introduction to viruses and I put together this slideshow so that anybody could watch it and learn the general nature of viruses. I did make this slide presentation to use the coronavirus as the model um, for talking about how viruses work. I have subsequent lectures planned for the two biology classes that I teach. Um, those will be in separate videos. So if you want to watch those, you can. I teach 10th grade biology, which is a first year biology class in high school. And then I also teach AP and dual enrollment biology. So that's going to be a higher level um, lecture for that information. So if you want to learn more about how viruses work, then keep watching. Viruses were actually discovered in the late 1800s. Farmers were struggling with their tobacco plants. Sometimes they would get this what they thought was an infection and they would turn yellow and get spots all over them. And so they turned to the scientists to, to help them figure out what was going on with their tobacco crops. And the scientists were kind of baffled because it didn't behave like anything living that was attacking the tobacco plants. But they noticed that they could actually get whatever this was out in the liquid portion of the plant. It was too small to be able to be seen under the microscope and they could crystallize the liquid and it would still be infectious. So they knew that it wasn't living, but it was some sort of particle that was um, killing off these tobacco plants. And so one of the scientists named it a virus, which is actually Latin for poison. Here's a pretty cool picture of a cell under viral attack. If you look really closely, you can see these little red spots on here. Those little red spots are actually virus particles. So you can see the size difference. This great big thing is the cell, and then all these little bitty red specks are actually a flu virus. They are in the process of budding out of this cell. So the cell itself is probably full of the virus, and this is what it looks like as it's coming out. I grabbed this picture from the textbook Campbell Biology published by Pearson Education Incorporated. So what is a virus made of anyway? Well, they're actually really, really simple. They have two components for sure, and sometimes a third component. That's it. They're not very complex. The first component that a virus has to have is a nucleic acid genome. And what a genome is, is it's basically the instructions for the virus to be able to do what it does. So that nucleic acid genome can be made of DNA or RNA, and it can be single-stranded or double-stranded. And if you have very much biology background, you may know that DNA in its double-stranded form is actually what the genome is made of for all living things um, as we know it on planet Earth. Everything is double-stranded DNA from bacteria, uh, funguses, animals, plants, you name it, every living organism is made of double-stranded DNA. So it's really interesting that there are viruses out there that have an RNA genome or can be single-stranded as the main form of the genome. The second component of a virus that is always there is a protein coat that surrounds that genome. Um, that protein coat is called a capsid, and it basically just holds the genome inside of it. The third component of a virus may or may not be present. It just depends on what kind of virus it is. And that third component is called an envelope or envelope, depending on how you say it. Um, it may have an envelope made of cell membrane, and it actually gets that envelope when it buds out of the cell that it has infected. So what ends up happening is that virus, as it buds out, it grabs some of that cell membrane and surrounds itself with it, and it kind of acts like a cloak. So it can sneak up on the next cell that it want to, wants to get inside of. It's kind of like, hey, nothing to see here, nothing going on here, boom, and then it's inside the next cell. 
Um, that envelope actually also displays little proteins on the outside of it that are specific to that virus and allows it to adhere to the cell that it's going to get into. So you can identify the, the virus itself based on the proteins that are stuck on the outside of that envelope. I'll show you a picture. Here's a great slide um, showing virus structure and composition. These pictures are from the biology textbook called Biology by Miller and Levine, published by Pearson Education. Um, so you can see three different, let's see if I can switch over to a uh, pen. You can see three different types of viruses and all three types of viruses have a genome. In this first one, the T4 bacteriophage, bacteriophage actually only infect bacteria. So you can see the genome is inside and this is made of DNA in a bacteriophage. The next type is the tobacco mosaic virus. This was the virus I was talking about in the beginning. You can see in this type of virus, it's actually an RNA genome. The third kind of virus that we have a picture of here is actually the flu virus. This is actually most similar to the coronavirus that we'll talk about in a few minutes. It has an RNA genome on the inside. Now, let's look at the capsid, okay? So the capsid, again, if you look at the T4 bacteriophage here, the capsid is shown in green. And bacteriophage are pretty cool because they have actually three parts. They have a head, a tail, and then these tail fibers. And in this picture, next to it over here, you can see that it's actually using those tail fibers to attach to the bacteria. And then the, the DNA is in here, and once it attaches, it actually squeezes that DNA down through the tail and into the bacteria. Over here with the tobacco mosaic virus, again, the capsid is shown in green, okay? And then in the flu virus, if you look really closely right in here, you can see that capsid layer. Let me switch colors and see if I can make it show up a little bit better. You can see this is the capsid layer right there, all right? Then the third component that a virus may or may not have is an envelope, okay? The envelope is only present between these three viruses on the flu virus, and it is shown in pink, okay? So this is the pink envelope layer, and then if you can see these little things sticking out, these are the surface proteins, okay? And coronavirus actually was named coronavirus because the little surface proteins specific to the coronavirus are crown shaped and corona means crown. So at this point, you might be asking yourself, well, wait a minute, Mrs. Fry said that viruses are not alive. So how do they replicate? How, how can there be so many of them if they're not alive? How do they replicate? Replication can only happen when that virus is inside of a host cell. So if there's virus laying on a surface somewhere, it's not growing there, it's just sitting there waiting to be picked up so that it can attach to a host cell and go inside and make more of itself. It takes over the cell machinery to make more of itself. The good news is viruses are specific to a certain species. There are viruses that are specific to bacteria that can't infect any other type of cell besides a bacteria. And then um, the viruses that can attach to animal cells are not gonna attach to the bacterial cells. Some viruses, however, can go between different animals and uh, humans are animals. So um, there are viruses that can cross between 
horse and a human, um, between a bat and a human, between pigs and humans, between birds and humans. And these are usually a little bit more dangerous because we can't control those animal populations as well, especially things like birds. Um, the term used for the viruses that can go between humans and other species is actually uh, coronaviruses included in this class. It's also good to know that most viruses are very specific to a particular type of tissue within that species. So when you get a cold, you actually get it up in your upper respiratory system. Um, coronavirus is actually more specific to the throat and the upper part of the lungs. So I'm going to focus a little bit more now specifically on animal viruses. In my other lectures to uh, my first year and my AP dual biology classes, I will give more specific information on all the different types of viruses. But right now I just want to focus on the animal viruses. Like I was telling you before, the genome of different viruses come in different flavors um, and the classes of animal viruses are actually divided up according to what type of genome that they have. The class one of animal viruses actually has double-stranded DNA. Um, some of them have envelopes. This one right here, the herpes virus, actually has an envelope and some of them don't. Um, the HPV, this is actually something that there's a vaccine out there for now, um, adenovirus, uh, respiratory viruses, things like that. This one that has an envelope causes smallpox. Down here in the class two of animal viruses, these have single stranded DNA, and this is the type of virus that causes parvo. DNA double stranded, I'm sorry, RNA double stranded RNA, Rio virus, okay, it can cause the rotavirus, which is diarrhea, uh, Colorado tick fever virus. So these are some examples of these three classes. In this slide, we have classes four, five, and six. Again, it, they're classified according to what the genome is made of. So here is single-stranded RNA. Some of them have an envelope, some of them don't. You can look at those. And look at that right there. This is the one that is uh, in the news right now, to say the very least. This is the structure of COVID-19 of this particular coronavirus, um, single-stranded RNA serves as the mRNA, and I'll show you a picture of how that works. Then we go on down here to class five. All of these have envelopes, and class six, this one also has an envelope. So what is the life cycle of a virus? Well, step one is that the virus binds to a specific host receptor with its own glycoprotein. That was the little spiky thing that I showed you in a picture a couple slides ago. Step two, then the virus actually gets inside of the cell where the envelope, if it has one, and the capsid itself are degraded or destroyed. The virus then uses the cell enzymes to replicate its own genome, while at the same time, the virus mRNA is translated to make more virus protein. So now you have your genome and you have the virus protein and what's really interesting is it all self-assembles. That protein can actually wrap around the genome to create more protein. The new viruses will then exit the cell if it uses the, um, the cell's membrane as a cloak, then it will bud out taking some of that membrane with it. If it doesn't, then it will actually bud out and not take the envelope with it. Sometimes viruses will just leak out slowly and the original cell stays intact, but sometimes viruses replicate so quickly that the cell actually bursts and all the viruses come out at once. It just depends on what kind of virus it is. So here's a picture of the process we just talked about. Some of these parts are pointed out. This is actually a picture of an enveloped RNA virus. So this is going to actually look like the, uh, the coronavirus. 
Uh, here's the capsid, which is this protein layer right here. The RNA is the genome that's inside, okay? And then here's the envelope right here. The glycoproteins are sticking out on the outside. So it gets inside the host cell, okay? And this part on the outside is actually degraded. So all you're left with is the RNA. This RNA will actually serve as a template for two different things to happen at the same time. If you go this direction, this template is actually made into a messenger RNA that will be translated, okay, to make more of these little glycoproteins that will actually, if you follow this pattern, it's happening in the ER, it's going to go to the outside of the cell so that ultimately when you get budding of the virus to the outside of the cell, these little glycoproteins are on there. So let's go back up here. Also at the same time, if you look up here, this viral genome is being translated to make more of the capsid proteins, okay, which are going to go on the outside. Okay, and it all self-assembles and then buds out and voila, you have a new virus. So if we look specifically at the coronavirus life cycle, um, it's just like the picture that I showed you on the last slide. It gains entry via a viral protein and the receptor that's specific on the cell. The viral genome is RNA and like I said before, living organisms don't have a genome made of RNA. So the coronavirus has to bring its own enzyme with it called an RNA polymerase. RNA polymerase that the coronavirus brings with it is capable of making more RNA from an RNA template. All other or all living organisms are able to take DNA and make RNA from that, but they don't have an enzyme that makes RNA from RNA. So coronavirus has to bring its own RNA polymerase for transcription and replication. So the new mRNA is translated for the capsid and the envelope proteins, and then the new virus particle is released in that envelope. And then just one more time, I'll let you take a minute and look at the picture. Feel free to pause it if you want to study it more. So how do you prevent a viral infection? Well, the best way is to not come into contact with a virus. It can infect you if it can't get to you, right? So social isolation, social isolation is what we're doing right now as a community. Also, if you are out and about, wash your hands. I'm going to make a separate video on how to wash your hands the right way, okay? Avoid crowds. Don't touch your face. Um, for goodness sakes, if, if you have a virus, don't go out into public. The coronavirus specifically can be in particles when someone coughs or sneezes. Um, it actually can survive on surfaces as well. Your hands can't get the virus, but what can get the virus is the tissues that are inside your nose and your throat and your upper respiratory system. So how does the virus get from your hands to inside? Well, if you rub your eye or even just very simply itch your nose just a second, you don't have to full out pick your nose to introduce the virus inside your nose. You can just rub your nose. And a lot of times people do this and they don't even realize they're doing it. We're so used to it. Maybe you have an itch inside of your ear. Maybe you sit with your hand on your face like that. Okay, there's a lot of times we touch our faces and we don't even realize it. Even just getting your hair out of your face like that, okay? If you have a little itch, for heaven's sakes, if you have something in your eye, just don't touch your face. <laughs> the other way that you can prevent yourself from getting a viral infection is to teach your immune system to fight it off. So if the virus does get into your system, your own immune system can take care of it. Um, this comes in the form of a vaccine. Um, as of the date of this recording, we don't have a vaccine for coronavirus yet, but there are lots of vaccines out there that we have for other viruses. Our children get vaccines for the deadliest versions of viruses out there that we can get. 
The flu virus right now is optional. Um, and so if there's a vaccine available for something, I would recommend getting it. It is not actually the virus that is introduced into your body. They just introduce a small piece of it, a piece that trains your immune system what that virus looks like so that if the actual virus is introduced to your system, your immune system is ready to go and it can knock it out before it infects. So just a couple of terms that you might hear thrown around. I wanted you guys to know what they're talking about. Emerging viruses. Emerging viruses are ones that have suddenly become apparent. It might be an old virus that all of a sudden is spreading, or it may be a new mutation in an old strain like the seasonal flu. Every year um, we get a new version of the flu vaccine because there are different versions of the flu that are mutating over time. So if you hear, hear the word epidemic, that applies to an emerging virus that's just spread over a particular region. The word pandemic, however, means it's the whole globe. When the pandemic happens, that means that the whole globe is experiencing an epidemic at the same time. So what about COVID-19? This is not an in-depth education on it, but just in general, it's good to know that the severity varies from person to person. Um, some people don't feel anything at all. Some people just feel like they have a cold. Some people feel like they have the flu. Most people recover just fine. There is, however, a part of our community that it is more dangerous for. Um, like the flu can be very dangerous for this population, the elderly, people who are immunocompromised, people who have poor lungs, or in general have um, a lot of longstanding health issues. It can also have a long incubation time. And what that means is you can be carrying this virus around and spreading it around and not even know that you have it. And that's why this is so dangerous. It spreads very easily, even if you don't have symptoms. And so what we're trying to do as a population is to protect the elderly, the immunocompromised, the people who have poor health or poor lungs. We're trying to protect them from getting the deadly uh, symptoms that can happen with this virus. So why social isolation? I keep saying isolation. Social isolation. The virus spreads very easily. The hospitals can't take care of a ton of new cases all at the same time. It is estimated that as many as 70% of all people will get this virus, but we're doing social isolation to ease the healthcare system load so that people who do need to go to the hospital aren't all gonna be going at once. Um, heart attacks, people who are having babies, people who are breaking bones, people who are in car accidents, they have to go to the hospital too. And if we're overwhelming the hospitals with people who are having breathing issues all at once, um, those people who also need hospital care aren't gonna get as good of care. So this is what's called flattening the curve. This, if you haven't seen this yet, take a look at it. It's how we can lessen the impact on the healthcare system. If you look over here, the healthcare system capacity is going to be this line. Okay, how much can the healthcare system take? If we don't do social isolation, the number of daily cases, this is what that curve could look like. Look at that. The outbreak peak. All right, would be way above the healthcare system capacity. This is without protective measures. If, however, we slow down the exposure rate and we spread it out, we flatten this curve, maybe the peak outbreak is actually going to barely touch the healthcare system capacity. And then we're going to see this happening. I hope this video introduction to viruses was helpful. If you would like to learn more about biology, then subscribe to the channel.